How many of you were here four weeks ago when we started this topic about Esther and uh, are excited to hear the conclusion of this part of it? I'm so glad that many new faces are in the audience today. I am sorry to tell you that I'm not going to re-preach that sermon today. You're going to have to go to the website grsdachurch.org and listen to the intriguing details of this story. If you missed it, uh, you're going to need to go back there to fill in some blanks that, that may startle you as some of the conclusions that we arrived at last time. The book of Esther is the story of a beautiful young woman with the Jewish name of Hadassah, who was chosen to be queen by King Xerxes from among hundreds of other women in the empire. She came to be known uh, to the Persian Empire and to us as Queen Esther. And that was our starting place a few weeks ago for a fantastic prophecy that outlines in detail the rest of Earth's history. I have for you a study guide that the deacons will pass out right now. There is enough for everyone, every adult, uh, who would like to take this home as a uh, reminder of what we're going to be covering here today. The story of Esther is an intriguing story that illustrates how the hand of God guides the future from the present just as he has the past. It also shows that each one of us have a role to play and a part to play in God's great master plan. Every one of us has come into this world for such a time as this. And the story of Esther illustrates that God's big wheel, remember the potter's wheel we talked about a few weeks ago, is always continually turning. You're on that little wheel where the potter does his work, unaware that the big wheel of God's providence is continually turning. The wheel of your circumstance may not seem proper to you. The wheel of your circumstance may say that things are going bad, but don't look around you, church. Look up. For God is in control. God is on His throne. In the book of Esther, there are four main characters. There's a villain, just like any good movie. Who's the villain's name? Remember that? His name is Haman. Ah, Haman is an ugly sort. (laughs) He had an axe to grind. A generational axe to grind. Some other time we'll go into his story. You'd be amazed at one of the reasons why he picks on the Jews. But he, he hatches this plot to exterminate all the Jews... In one day. (laughs) Well, what he did not know was that Queen Esther was herself a Jew. In fact, perhaps because she was of mixed race. Hint, you need to go back and listen to the previous sermon. Because she was of mixed race, not even the king knew that Esther was a Jew. And so he signed off on Haman's plan. Another character in this story is Mordecai. Mordecai is Esther's cousin by by blood, but he's also her adopted adoptive father. He was the great grandson of a Jewish nobleman named Kish, who was brought to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar at the same time that Daniel was brought there. You can find uh, that story in Esther chapter 2 verses 5 and 6. The story says that Mordecai, quote, sat within the king's gate. And we looked at this last time, and we uh, conjectured that this This means that Mordecai was a representative of the Jewish nation in Medo-Persia. And as such, he was in charge of translating the edicts and the orders of the king into Hebrew for the Jews. I conjecture that because he is the first one to realize that something is afoot. That the Jews are going to be exterminated because he reads the order. And so he sends word to his adopted daughter, Esther, who is now queen, and he says to her, please go in and talk to the king, and maybe you can defend God's people from your position. And Esther refuses at first. I'm I'm summarizing the story. If you haven't read the story in a while, go back to it this afternoon. It's a very short book, but there are some powerful details in there that speaks to our times today. But anyway, Esther refuses at first. Why? Well, she fears that she could be executed if she walks into the king's throne room uninvited. It was the law. But Mordecai's answer is very compelling. In Esther chapter 4 and verse 13, he says, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than any of the other Jews. Verse 14. 
For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows, who knows, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther then instructed Mordecai to, and I quote from verse 16, gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. It's not enough. She gives instructions on the fasting. Neither eat or drink. See, some people fast just food. Some people fast food and drink. She wants them to neither eat or drink for how many days? Ouch! Night or day. See, that, that some people fast, and we just got through the Ramadan period. You know, Muslims fast during the day, but they gorge themselves at night. That's not fasting. Esther says, don't eat night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And though it's against the law, I will go to the king. And if I perish, I perish. Esther's prayer, her faith, and her action brought deliverance to the Jews in that time of danger. Friends, we too are living in dangerous times, perilous times. Second Timothy chapter 3 tells us that in the last days, perilous times will come. Dangerous times will come. What kind of danger? Verse 2, 2 Timothy chapter 3. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. What else? Boastful? Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal. And the list goes on without love for what is good. Traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. And Paul says, avoid these people. Jump to verse 12. He says, in fact... We have these words up here. Okay. In fact, he says in verse 12, that's uh, again 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, in fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be, what? Persecuted. Evil people and imposters will become worse Deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, he says, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you. And you know that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Then he says, all scripture. How much? All of scripture is inspired by God. And is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good good work. Church, in times like these, the ones we're living in, we came to the conclusion last time that in times like these, we need to fast and pray. In fact, that day that I preached that sermon, it was a day of fasting and prayer also for the church. We need to fast and pray. Secondly, we need to hold on. Hold on to one another. We discovered this from Scripture. To one another, and one more thing. Hold on to the faith that was once delivered to us. So not only do we need to fast and pray, not only do we need to hold on, we also need to stand firm on the Word of God. These are the times that we're living in. And 2 Timothy chapter 3 is very clear on what we need to do. Praying, holding on, standing firm on the word of God. Mordecai was right. God brought Esther to the Persian kingdom for such a time as this. God used Esther's position and her influence to save his people from extermination at that time. However, however, I hinted to you last time that there may have been another reason with far-reaching consequences. Let's review what we learned about Esther, shall we? Really quick. Esther is made queen in the tenth month of the seventh year of Xerxes' reign. That's the year 478 before Christ. I want to jot this down on your notepads. I had everything ready for the screen, for those, for those of you who are visual, but it seems to not be working right now. So that's the year 478 that Esther is made queen. That date will become important in just a little bit. 
Esther chapter 2, verse 16. Esther 2.16 tells us she becomes queen in the 10th month of the 7th year of Xerxes' reign. That's the year 478. But we must go back 61 years in history to see how the hand of God was already setting it up. Cyrus the Second, Cyrus the Great, conquered Babylon in the year 539 before Christ. 539. That was Cyrus who came through under the gates of the city on the drier riverbed. You've heard the story, no doubt. Cyrus was followed by a king named Cambyses, and then a king, king named Bardia. Uh, he was nicknamed Smyrtis, and there was a very interesting story about Smyrtis. I told you last time. Go back and listen to the recording. After Smyrtis came Darius the first, and then Xerxes, Esther's Xerxes, his name is also known in the book of Esther as Ahasuerus. We believe that's the Jewish name that the Jews gave him. Ahasuerus is Xerxes, same person. And after Xerxes came his son, Artaxerxes, the son of Xerxes. He, was also, he also had a nickname. His nickname was Longimanus. Longimanus, meaning long hand. <laughs> now, these are the kings of this period surrounding the time of Esther. Now, based on the works of the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, we learned last time that modern historians accept a queen named Amestris as Xerxes' wife and the mother of King Artaxerxes. Her name is Amestris, A-M-E-S-T-R-I-S. According to Herodotus, Amestris was the daughter of a nobleman named Otanes. And some of you last time were already Googling and searching on Wikipedia about this guy while the sermon was going on. I'm glad to see you're, you're involved and interacted uh, that way. Now, according to Herodotus, by the way, you need to go back and listen to that sermon. Did I mention that? Okay. <laughs> it's an intriguing subplot of Herodotus' histories of how Otanes may have been a Jewish nobleman, just like Daniel who came to marry, and how he came to marry King Darius's sister, who then gives birth to Amestris. And how after the death of Darius, Amestris married Darius, uh, or Darius's son, I should say, Xerxes. So Amestris marries Xerxes in secular history. Esther says uh, that he had a, a queen named Vashti, who was deposed, and then about three years after his reign, Xerxes marries Esther. Uh, you could already hear the, the, the similarity in the names Amestris and Esther. Some modern historians acknowledge that, and I quote, given the similarity of names and the parallel identification of Ahasuerus with her husband Xerxes, it is possible, very possible, that Amestris and Esther are the same person. Now, is there biblical support for this uh, possibility? I want to take you to Nehemiah in the Old Testament, chapter 2. And verse 1, Nehemiah 2 and verse 1. In the book of Nehemiah, we find that Nehemiah is the cup bearer of, to King Artaxerxes I in the 12th year of his reign. Artaxerxes is about 32 years old at this point. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1 tells us that. This fact raises some interesting questions for me. And this is what set me out on this quest to know the connection between Esther and Xerxes and Artaxerxes. The, the question is, why would King Artaxerxes place a person from a conquered nation as his cupbearer? Do you know what the responsibility of a cupbearer was? Prevent the king from being poisoned. They did this a lot back then. Now, <laughs> would you put a conquered enemy in a position of trust like this? doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me, so I started digging. Another question that I thought about is why was the king so interested in the feelings of a Jewish servant, servant named Nehemiah? Nehemiah says in uh, chapter 2, verse 2, the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This could only be sadness of heart. He's interested in his Jewish servant. And why then was he so generous? To both Ezra and Nehemiah. And, and Ezra he sends earlier in his reign to Jerusalem to restore the worship of Yahweh and to teach the Torah to those who didn't know it. And this started me thinking. Why is this guy so pro-Jewish? Why does he have a Jew as his cupbearer? And why was he so generous to the Jews? I can find no reason more powerful 
than the influence, at least the influence, of Esther, who I think, and other historians think, was his Jewish mother. In fact, the story of of how Artaxerxes himself becomes king illustrates how the hand of God guides the future from the present, just as he has the past. Now, this I'm going to be repeating this because I think it's a powerful mantra to understand that God is in control. He guides the future from the present, just as he has the past. That means our present was guided by God in the past. Our future is guided by God in the present. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. According to, to Greek sources, King Xerxes the Great had six sons by Queen Amestris, or Esther, if you will. Do we have those names yet? Okay. First one's name was Amethyst. That's the oldest son, Amethyst. Then comes Artaxerxes. And we need to designate him as Artaxerxes I or Artaxerxes Longimanus because there were other Artaxerxes in Persian history. But the first Artaxerxes is the second son of Ahasuerus, Xerxes. He had other sons, Darius, Hestapes, Achaemenes, and Rodogun. Forget about those names. I want you to think and remember about those first two, Amethyst and Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes, as I said, was nicknamed Artaxerxes Longimanus in several historical sources. This is because, allegedly, his right arm was longer than his left arm. Interesting, right? Well, I want you to notice, again, that Artaxerxes was how many people in line to the throne? Two, right? He was the second in line to the throne. All right. But his father Xerxes, Ahasuerus, was killed in the fall of 465 before Christ by his own counselor, Artabanus. And the counselor also killed his firstborn, Amethyst. And then he declared himself the king of Persia. Ah, you see the, the pieces coming on the chessboard? You know how I, I see it's a great controversy. You know, the devil tries to put his pieces in play, but God is in Control! <laughs> Several months later, Artabanus, the one who killed Xerxes and his firstborn son Amethyst, Artabanus himself is killed by guess who? Artaxerxes in hand-to-hand combat when he was just 12 years old. What a feat for a child, 12 years old, you might say. Well, remember, these kids were trained in combat from a very young age. That was their life, to be soldiers, to be warriors. But the murderer of his father is killed by Artaxerxes in hand-to-hand combat. And I believe that that longer right arm may have also given him a surprise advantage. What do you think? (laughs) Artaxerxes then took the throne as the rightful king of Persia. And listen carefully. And Esther... The queen mother would still be alive at this time. And a child king would need his mommy. Yes, he would. If Artaxerxes is 11 or 12 years old when he assumes the throne, he had to have been born in the year 476. What year did Esther become queen? You wrote it down. 78. Remember, we're going backwards before Christ, okay? So... All right, Xerxes is born about two years, a year and a half to two years after Esther becomes queen. So, it is possible, do you see, for Esther to be the mother of Artaxerxes, and that would make him half Jewish. Well, some of you technicians may correct me and say, well, quarter Jewish, if Esther was half Jewish, right? By the way, the determination of being Yehudim, which is Jewish, that determination is matrilineal, meaning it comes through your mother. If you're born to a Jewish mother, then you are a Jew, regardless of if you're practicing Judaism or not. So it's matrilineal, unless a person converts to Judaism. Esther's mother may not have been Jewish, but Esther was raised by who? Mordecai, and she may in fact have converted to Judaism, (laughs) making her a Jew. In any case, Mordecai considered Esther Yehudim. Remember the story? Don't think you'll escape if you're in the palace. He considered her Jewish. So what would that make Artaxerxes, church? Wow. It blew my mind when I came to this conclusion. But you see, God is orchestrating the future from the present, just as he has the past. 
to, for, by whatever means necessary. <laughs> Even using this situation, to say the least, that would not have been ideal, because he told his people not to intermarry, not because he was racist, <laughs> because he did allow uh, people who converted to Judaism to intermarry. It was a spiritual thing, you see. It was not a racial thing. But here is this situation, and that gives me hope, because our situations aren't always perfect, aren't they? You know, you, some of you are crying to the Lord today about your kids. We do too, you know. You never know. They have to make decisions in their lives today. And the devil is, is working over time because he knows he has little time. Put those kids in the hands of the Lord because he is guiding their future today just as he has the past. And he can use even some circumstances that may seem ugly for his honor and glory and to fulfill his perfect plan, his purposes. Amen? Amen to that, yes. Well, if Artaxerxes was at least part Jewish, that would explain why he had a Jew in the trusted position of cupbearer, because he himself was a Jewish descendant. It would also explain why he was so generous to Ezra and Nehemiah when he sent them to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and to restore the worship of Yahweh and to teach the Torah. Now, as for the other reason why God raised Esther to the throne of Persia, I want to remind you that it was King Artaxerxes I of Persia, Longimanus, who in the 20th year of his reign, the year 457 before Christ, issued the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Well, I can tell that some of you don't know why that's important. Well, let me enlighten you. Why is that important? Let's go to the screen. Right here to the... Uh, okay? Alright. Good. Let me enlighten you as to what. This date, 457, write it down on your notes. 457 started the countdown of the 2300 year prophecy of Daniel 8 and 9. Daniel 9.25 tells us that the start of that date, of that prophecy, is the, the year that the decree to rebuild Jerusalem uh, goes out. And who gives that decree? Artaxerxes, Esther's son. I, I feel free to say that now. This prophecy predicted with pinpoint uh, accuracy the birth of Jesus Christ 500 years before it happened. It predicted the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary 500 years before it happened. And I'm not getting this thing to, to pass here. I want to do that manually, okay? It also predicted his baptism and the year when he was anointed as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Remember the story? Uh, remember the story how John sees him coming and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Well, the 2300 year prophecy predicts all these things. Predicts his birth, his baptism, his death. And it goes beyond that to the year 1844 of our time with the cleansing of the sanctuary. And this signals right here the beginning of this prophetic day of atonement that we are currently living in. You've heard about it, the day of judgment, the investigative judgment in the last phase of the ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary as priest of the heavenly sanctuary in the years just before he returns to earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This prophecy is important to Seventh-day Adventists. It was what started us on this path of becoming a church. The coming of Jesus, Adventist, burns within our heart. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We understand, based on this prophecy, that we are living in the last days of earth's history. There we go. Now it's working. Thank you, guys. We've been having some gremlins working on that computer over time today. Now, the 2300 year prophecy made simple for you in the last few minutes that we've got together. The first part of this prophecy is, is carved out in a period of 70 weeks. It all began with the prophet Daniel, who was praying one day over the fate of Jerusalem uh, that had been ruined years before by the Babylonians. The entire book of Daniel focuses on the plight of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem, both of which were destroyed. But Daniel's view goes beyond the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly temple. Daniel chapter 8 
And verses 13 and 14 says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain holy one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary or of the sanctuary and the host of heaven to be trampled underfoot? Verse 14 of Daniel 18 says, And he said to me, some of you memorize this, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. That's where that prophecy is. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. It's not on the screen. Daniel 8 verse 14. The point of the prophecy is the restoration of the sanctuary and the host of heaven. The 2300 day prophecy outlines year by year by year when and how the restoration of the sanctuary in heaven takes place. As Daniel was praying, the angel Gabriel (laughs) appeared to him. And he broke this timeline down for Daniel and for us to understand. He said, 70 weeks are determined for your people. 70 weeks for your people and your holy city. Simply put, Gabriel told Daniel something it was going to happen to the Jews. And to their city. In 70 weeks. Now, 70 weeks is just a little over 16 actual months. But Daniel understood that in Bible prophecy, a day is symbolic for an actual year. That's what Daniel understood. For example, this principle is cited in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34, where God gives us each day for a year. And here is another example of that in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. I have laid on you each day for what? Each day for a year. That is why Daniel is so stunned at the length of time that it would take to cleanse the sanctuary. When you go back and read it in chapter 8, he's amazed. Man, this is too long. Because he understands it from a prophetic point of view. It's not 16 months. It's 2,300 years. And that is why he recognized also the closeness of the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy that the captivity, the Babylonian captivity that he was in, was about to end. That's Daniel chapter 9. We're not going into that today. But he didn't know when the 2,300 years of chapter 8 would begin or what important events lay within that period. So the explanation comes in Daniel chapter 9. What is the starting of the prophecy? Daniel wrote, and that's an error there, by the way. It's not 725, it's 925. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to do what? To rebuild or build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. If you add those up, that's 69 weeks. It's another way of saying it. Daniel 9, 25. Now, in Daniel's day, Jerusalem was in ruins. It was destroyed by the, by the Babylonians. The Persians would soon allow, our Xerxes would soon allow the Jews to return and build. Gabriel tells Daniel, from the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, there would be how many weeks? 69 weeks. If you multiply that by 7 days, it will equal 483 days. And when you apply the day for a year principle, 483 days equals 483 what? Years. Alright, are you following me? Alright, there's one question though. Who is this Messiah the Prince? The, The word Messiah means anointed one. It's the same word that in Greek is Christ. means Anointed. Messiah. And, and so, the anointed one of God was Jesus Christ, right? And here the Bible describes Jesus' anointing. Now, uh, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized And while he prayed, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, read it with me, You are my beloved in whom in whom I am well pleased. Who is the anointed one? He was anointed at his baptism when the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and the Father anoints him. And Jesus immediately begins... His ministry as Messiah. It was the year 27 A.D., exactly as predicted in the book of Daniel. 
In that 2300 day prophecy, more than 500 years before, God had said when his son was going to be born. It had said when he would be anointed as Messiah. You know, this is just another proof that Jesus Christ is the true Messiah. The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form upon him at his anointing. The Bible is no ordinary book. Bible prophecy is God's way of saying to us and telling us that he's in control. God is telling us ahead of time what he plans to do. See, if I call uh, my job on Sunday evening and say, uh, or call my boss on Sunday evening and say, boss, I'm not coming in tomorrow because I have made a doctor's appointment. Am I a prophet? How do I know I'm going to the doctor? Because I made those plans. But that's what prophecy is. It's God telling us what his plans are for history. That's what it is. And the purpose of prophecy is not for us to know the future. Jesus himself said in the book of John, that the purpose of prophecy is to affirm our faith. I have told you these things, he said, so that when, you be, when, when they come to pass, you will believe in me. That's it. Are you going to trust God? It's not about whether you understand the time or the times. It's not about time. It's about trust. Trusting God. That's the purpose of prophecy. The Bible is no ordinary book. God is telling us way ahead of time, 500 years before it happened, that Jesus would be baptized in the year 27 AD, exactly as predicted by this prophecy. Now, at this point, we have uh, covered about 483 years, which brings us to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, after the 69-week period. Now, that's when the Messiah is cut off. Verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be what? Cut off. Strange uh, term, right? And it says he won't be cut off by himself, with himself, for himself. So that is something he's doing, but he's not doing it, or it's happening to him, but it's not happening to him for his benefit. Uh, read the words carefully. It says it's, it's, he's be cut off, but not for himself. What does that mean? I think the meaning is very clear. Jesus will be killed sometime after the year 27 A.D. But it wasn't just any killing, church. The Bible says that God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for whom? For us. He wasn't cut off for himself. He was sacrificed to atone for your sins and for mine. But wait, there's more! (laughs) We've covered 69 of the 70 weeks. There's still one more week to go, right? Look at what else the prophecy says about Jesus. And remember that this was written 500 years before it happened. There we go. Daniel 9.27 Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Hmm... What is a week? How many days? Seven days. What would be half of a week? Three and a half days. Or in this case, it's prophetic. So three and a half years. Does that ring a bell? Three and a half years after Jesus is baptized, in the middle of the week, Jesus is crucified. Right on schedule. During the celebration of Passover, in the spring of the year 31, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Not for himself. All the animal sacrifices of the previous centuries, going way back to Abraham, had finally met fulfillment in Jesus Christ. They ceased to have meaning because the real Lamb of God, to which they pointed, had been sacrificed once and for all. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. What happened in the temple when Jesus died illustrates the importance and the completeness of the sacrifice. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, the Gospels tell us. Wow. 
The way now is open to the throne room of God, to the most holy place. We can come directly through Jesus Christ to God himself. I mean, these, these word pictures are powerful when you understand them in the light that God intends them to be understood. The temple was the center of sacrificial service. God himself had given his people these sacrifices. But they are no longer needed because Jesus died for our sins, for the sins of the entire world. (laughs) Does this make sense? All right, let's see. What have we learned so far? So far we learned that Jesus, uh, I think we skipped a lot of things here. There we go. We learned that Jesus was, uh, I don't see it there. He was baptized in what year? In the year 27 A.D. That's at the end of the 69 weeks. Halfway through the 70th week is the year 31. That's when Jesus, the Lamb of God, is sacrificed for our sins. The, from the minute, in the ministry of Jesus, from his baptism to his death, there are exactly three and a half years. Exactly as the Bible foretold. Now finally, we come to the last part of that 70th week. The last three and a half years. Halfway through that 70th week... What happens? Well, Jesus has gone to heaven. The disciples begin preaching. Uh, in, in the very first day on Pentecost, at least 3,000 people, if not more, were converted and baptized and joined this new group of believers. And then the Jewish leaders began to take notice. And they began to persecute those who were off the way, it's called. Those who believed in Jesus Christ as Messiah. And somebody said in the audience, Three and a half years after Jesus' crucifixion, Stephen, that first one of those first deacons, was stoned to death by the Jews. Three and a half years later, exactly as the 2300 day prophecy predicted. Something happens there. What happens? It's the end of the 70 week period. But what's the importance of this 70 week period? Well, God had told Daniel that 70 weeks were determined for his people and for his city. Remember? When they stoned Stephen, the Jewish leaders were saying, as for our nation, as for this temple, we have nothing to do with Jesus, who is called the Christ. Seventy weeks. And after that, the gospel started going to the rest of the world. You know, the Bible tells us that those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Why were they scattered? Because of persecution. And they had to leave Jerusalem now. And with them went the good news that Jesus saved. That news came to us in America. Somehow, somewhere, by someone. And today we are sitting here because the Jews rejected the Messiah, persecuted the followers of Jesus, and the gospel news was spread to all the world. I love how God operates. Sometimes out of adversity, He brings something good, doesn't He? Never despise the day of small beginnings, He says to us. Remember, God is in control. The book of Acts, chapter 8 and verse 4, describes that those who were scattered by the persecution went everywhere preaching the word. Remember we read earlier in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all those who would follow Christ would receive what? persecution. It still happens today. You stand up for what is truth, they'll call you all kinds of names. Persecution in our country is not so heavy, but in some places in the world, people are in prison because of their faith. The time from the death of Jesus to the stoning of Stephen was exactly three and a half years. That's the end of this part of this amazing prophecy. We're going to look at the rest of it some other time. And now people everywhere like us have this great promise of salvation that was offered through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Three and a half years, just like it was predicted. Quick review. What happens in the year 27? Jesus is baptized. What happens in the year 31? That's at the middle of the week, the last week of the 70-year prophecy. He's crucified, and here you you and I are here today to enjoy that benefit. What happens in the year 34 A.D.? Stephen is stoned. That's the end of the 70-week period, the opportunity for the Jews. And then the gospel goes to the entire world. And here we stand right now, forgiven before God. Forgiven. All we have to do is come before God and claim for ourselves the merits that Jesus won for us on the cross of Calvary. The wages of sin is death. There is a death penalty over us. 
Because who, which one of us is not a sinner? But the gift of God. I like butts in the Bible. <laughs> there are some little butts and some big butts. I think this is a big one. The wages of sin is that but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give Him praise and glory in the house today. We are forgiven. We don't have to kill an animal. <laughs> we don't have to pay money in order to be forgiven by God. All we have to do is come before Him and claim for ourselves the merits of Jesus. Church, Jesus Christ loves you. God loves you. He demonstrated this by walking all the way up Calvary, being flogged all the time. His suffering, physical, was paled in comparison to the mental anguish that he felt when he was separated from his father. See, sin brings separation from the giver of life. And that is what we will experience if we do not avail ourselves of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Eternal separation from the giver of life brings eternal death. That's what Jesus felt on the cross. But he loved you so much. The Bible says that because of the prize that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. You were the prize. Amen. I was the prize. And for that, he endured the cross because he saw you, he saw me at the finish line. What an amazing book the Bible is. What an amazing God the Bible reveals. Jesus came on time for us. He died on time for us. And He is coming back on time for us. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I believe this with all my heart. He said He would come. And He will come on time. In two weeks, I'm going to ask the question, is Jesus still coming soon? I'm going to ask it and answer it. The answers may surprise you. I don't think you've heard it put this way before. I want to see you back here in two weeks as we explore how soon Jesus is coming back or is he really coming back soon. But in these perilous times, let us take every opportunity to fast and pray. What else? Let us hold on to one another and to the faith we once received. And thirdly, let us stand firm on the Word of God, the precious Word of God. Every prophecy is given for our instruction. Every prophecy says to us, God is in control. Don't give up. Hold on to what you have received. Jesus is coming soon. In the meantime, fast and pray and hold on to one another and hold on to faith. For each one of us, has come into this world for such a time as this. And God has a place and a role for each one of us to play in His master plan as He guides the future from the present just as He has the past. Today is a day of salvation. It's a day to make a commitment to the cross of Jesus Christ again. I want to be the first to stand up with you and say, Lord, I give you my life. Lord, I trust you. Lord, although I don't understand everything that's going on, I see how you have guided the present from the past, and I am trusting you that you will guide the future. If this is what you would say, stand with me as we make this prayer of commitment to God and to the cross of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, by standing, we are acknowledging that you are in control. By standing... We are yielding to you our will and trusting you that you would guide our life through, that you would place us where we would be a better benefit for your kingdom and that one day soon we will see you bring to an accomplishment, to fruition, to completion, the plan that you started so long ago. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your spirit to guide us into the knowledge of truth. And thank you for the gift of life in Jesus Christ, to whom be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.